Okay. Ready when you are. <laughs> we can lead into it however we want to lead into it. Can like can you uh, can you like you can't hear like I mean I mean you, this is like no a it's microphone? it's recording oh okay <laughs> <laughs> testing testing <laughs> um, but yeah I was curious first question then I'll ask you that because I was curious I've never really got the answer to that your passion for writing where did it come from uh, it came when I moved to Thunder Bay uh, well it wasn't Thunder Bay it was Fort William at the time I was ten years old. And I was, we were all close to my grandmother, my mom's mom, and uh, she liked writing. And she would write us letters, and in those days you wrote letters. You didn't write emails, and you didn't write text, you wrote letters. And so uh, my mom encouraged me to write letters to her. And uh, I learned, like, she really liked to hear stories and stuff, so I became a storyteller through letter writing. And I knew she liked to laugh, so I would tell her some funny things. And so it, it developed from there, really. Mom's mom. So that was Kitty, was her name? Yeah, Kitty. Ah, uh -huh, interesting. Yeah. How do you find that the changing in technology now, do you find that's changed your writing? Like how it's typing, it's emails, it's Facebook. And yeah, I don't write There's something as much. different to getting a letter, right? You know, it's a special oh, yeah. feeling when you go to the mailbox and you open that up and someone mm -hmm. took the time oh, to sure. write a letter to you. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it's very different now. It's, uh, it's, um, safe and in, like I don't know when, when you wrote a letter you had to think about what you were writing so there was intention with it now it's mm -hmm. just you know let's get this over with and get my message across like whatever my information across but there doesn't uh, doesn't seem to be the intimacy in that a letter maybe maybe intimacy isn't the word but the thought process in it you know it's quick it's like the mcdonald's type version you know let's mm -hmm. get satisfaction fast something because it was kind of nice to wait for a letter and wait and then you finally got it and it, like you would I, I would run to my bedroom and read it you know it was like a gift mm -hmm. yeah non-disposable too i guess eh it's something you can hold on to. So I'm curious, because we're in Westfort, what was it like being in Westfort here? Do you remember this street, Yeah, it's Frederica? funny you should say that, because when we were standing in mm. that alcove waiting for this, the, the alarm to go off. <laughs> <laughs> Which um, we set off. Uh, yeah, I was thinking it was different in those days, where the Royal Bank was, it was a, an empty lot, and, and every winter they'd have like a carnival there, mm -hmm. and a stage and everything, and then there was the... Uh, the um, hardware store down the street, I remember going to that and really liking going to the hardware store. I remember smoking my cigarettes when I was 13 years old in the Coney Island, my yep. dad catching us. Coney but, Island was still around back yeah, then? Yeah, Coney Island was... What year was that when you moved here? Well, no, that would have been when I was 13, so three years later. I moved here in 1959. 59, how old? Eight? Ten. Ten. Yeah, you told me that. So, yeah. So Coney Island's been around that long. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. a long time. Yeah. Now, did you ever run into Papa on the streets of Frederica at a 10-year-old, or is that no, later you met him? No, no, I didn't. Uh, I, I didn't go to the same school as him, like grade school, and I didn't go to the same high school as him, so... What grade school did you go to? St. Martin's. <clears throat> oh, the same big one there? Yeah. No, it was The one that was across the old from one. The old one, yeah. Yeah, the old one, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it was different then, eh? They had a boy's side and a girl's side. Huh. And you, you had, like, you, the boys went down one set of stairs for recess, and the girls went down another set. And the boys played in the field part, and the girls played in the front part. Mm -hmm. You didn't mix. Huh. I don't know what that would be like. That'd be weird. I the days, that the days of getting the strap, which I got fairly often. Oh, I am yeah. not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> what did you get the strap? That's interesting. I know. I often wonder that. Working it would leave you welts on your arms, eh? Well, I know. I wonder that, like, working in a school, how different that must have been when they could hit people. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, sometimes I get mad at a kid where you're you're frustrated and, you know, you get you boil up a little bit. And yeah. back then, people just, they swatted? Or was it more planned? Um, well, it was mostly the nuns. They got away with it, I think, you know, because they were religious. Oh, uh, they had that <laughs> they, code of religious. I remember, I remember once getting my hair done and I thought, 
I looked like a movie star. I was in grade seven and I had like wings, you know. I looked like a yak actually, but it, <laughs> no, but it, I remember standing, there was Chapel's department store and I was looking in the window and I felt like a movie star because I had these big wings sticking out the side because eh? graduation was in a few days and I wanted a new hairdo. And I went to school and um, uh, a nun, I won't say her name, but she was known for her physical tirades and um, she uh, thought I, I did something and I, I don't know what I did but she grabbed my hair and just shook me shook me shook me <laughs> shook me and my my yak hairdo was like all cockeyed oh after God. you know but she was mad at me for something I don't know I never did find out what I did but yeah they now, could do stuff like that the nuns were the nuns the teachers yeah they were yeah. the teachers? Yeah. So they have well, she was a substitute. She was the, the superior, like the, the head honcho nun. And she would come in sometimes when a, a teacher was sick. Mm -hmm. And then our teacher was sick, so she was in, and we would just dreaded it when we saw her. Yeah. It was a lot different when I moved here. I moved from a French-Canadian culture I had grown up with in t for 10 years and in St. Boniface, Manitoba. And... I went to a school called Marion School, and it was an all-girls school, and it was we wore uniforms, and it was pretty refined, mm -hmm. and uh, pretty uh, the nuns there. I don't so know, nuns taught there too. Yeah, and I don't know what why those nuns weren't abusive, but they weren't. There was mm -hmm. no strap there. I don't ever remember. I went to grade five there, and there was no strap or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the difference was between there and here, but here they really whacked you with that strap a lot. You know? Now. I'm kind of curious, do you, do you think, because you know a lot of people talk about traumas lately, trauma is kind of the big word, in mean, mental health a lot, you know what I mean? And do you think people had effects from that, being hit, or like, or is that just because it was so commonplace, do you think I think it was just common. It off? You huh? didn't, it wasn't trauma because it was more common, like that's what happened, and that's, even your parents spanked you and kicked you sometimes. <laughs> so I wonder when, do you remember when, were you around in school when it went from nuns teaching to an actual educator who was, you know what I mean, qualified and educated in teaching? Well, when I was going to school back then, <clears throat> it was uh, it was private, like, you know, well, not, actually in Winnipeg it was private, maybe that was it, it was private schools, like you paid to go to school. Mm -hmm. Like you, you what, it's not part, it was partly subsidized, but here, uh, it, when it became subsidized or pretty well funded by the government it changed there was a lot more restrictions and and people had to answer to things you know the the, the people in charge mm. private so your parents had to pay well we paid for high school they really? they wanted me to go to St. Patrick's High School and that, there was a tuition there yeah what would that have run like uh, back then I, I I'm um, pretty sure it was 800 a year back then for one for eight hundred like yeah dollars. which which would probably be equivalent now to about six seven thousand holy moly really yeah and how did your parents afford that with seven kids well that they, would have been they, a lot that of money, was no? part of who they were they thought that was an, a real ideal like that you you uh, got taught in your faith along with everything else that was that was crucial to them that you go to a Catholic school hmm. That's pretty interesting. I would never have guessed that you'd have to pay to do all that. Yeah, and and part of my story with that is I had a real artistic side, and there was no art at St. Patrick's High School, and I was also very athletic, and the, you know wasn't it wasn't top notch for athlete, ath, you know athletic type um, programs, so. Uh, I guess I had to kind of swing into the academic portion, and I, you know, I, I I was intelligent enough, but I did I was not disciplined enough because I wasn't doing what I wanted to do. I really wanted to do art, and my mom, to the day she almost died, she regretted that that she didn't have, hadn't put me any art programs and things like that. You know. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's interesting you bring that up. That's something I noticed from working in school. That's swung heavily the other way. What? Not swung. I wouldn't say is the correct word, but. Uh, it's accentuated even more as the arts with the kids now, like with with computers and mm -hmm. using YouTube to drawing tutorials or just stuff to yeah. come up with. You should see the stuff they come up with. Well, it's really amazing. I know with my grandkids when they come over, like 
uh, that's what they want to do it at my house all the time. Mm -hmm. The first thing they say is, let's do some art, Grandma, because they know I do art. And I think that there's a craving in all of us to do art. Like, there's there's that part of us that we're all artistic. We all want to create. And, um, you know, it, it, there's not that much of an opportunity now to, mm -hmm. to do that, you know, because everything is more... Uh, structured and regulated and they took I know when I was I worked in the school system and when I worked there they they reduced the funding for the art program and which was ridiculous you know but anyway that you know it's one of the areas they'll hit first is remove you know hit on the arts mm, yeah I guess so eh? yeah and student supports <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we won't get into that. We won't get into we? that. Um, a neat question, because I, I brought this up to you before, and it's 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 really a different thing interviewing a guest versus your mom, and try not to be an interview, and try not to be a yeah. son, and try yeah, not to yeah. do that. But I found some really neat questions when looking online, and one of them really stuck out to me, and I really want to ask you, because I probably asked you every question almost in the sun already in life in general, but I, I like this one for some reason, so I want to ask you it. When would you say was the biggest fork in the road that you came to in your life? And what was it, and why was it the biggest fork in your road? Like biggest you, fork, biggest in, fork in the road, like where your life... Yeah, yeah, you know we're, I mean? we're like, swung we all, in a different direction. You have those, like, you know, existential moments in life where your life could go one way, it could go the other, you could choose to be in a relationship, to not to mm -hmm. be in a relationship. You can, I guess when I got married. Yeah? Yeah, that, that and later on in life when I chose sobriety. You know, chose not to drink and drug anymore, but uh, but mainly when I got married, because all of a sudden, it's not that it wasn't carefree anymore, but I had to have I had to be responsible because I was with a responsible person, and I had to think not just for myself. I had to think for another person too. Like I, I was, I wasn't just me. I was another. I was a couple, mm -hmm. so I couldn't just do what I damn well please because, you know, from I, I don't even remember from say sixteen till twenty two. I think I had about ten jobs or something. You know, like I when mm -hmm. things when things didn't kind of. It's not that they didn't go my way, but you know, I just wanted to move on. I, I just so I couldn't do that anymore. I had to. Stick to something and uh, think financially and think, um, you know, all sorts of responsible ways. So that was a big fork for me because uh, I was pretty footloose and fancy free. Mm -hmm. And as you know, this story, and I'll tell it, is your father and I were dancing in Mexico. We had been married about 40 years mm -hmm. and um, we're now married 48 and we had been married about 40 years and we were dancing in our condo to a song we liked and and uh, it, it was The Valley by Katie Lang and she says in the song I like the best in you, you like the best in me mm -hmm. and um, I don't know why it just brought tears to my eyes and your dad said to me why are you crying? and I said I don't know I just I can't imagine like, what life would have been like if we hadn't have met? Like, what would have happened to us? And in his stoic way, he was silent for about 30 seconds, and I thought, oh well, I guess he didn't hear me. And then he said, well, you would have been totally bohemian, and I would have been totally boring. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, that, that the, the marriage part, you know, sometimes we get afraid of committing to a person and and we wonder if we're with the right person and all those kind of things but I think that God places people in our lives for a reason and uh, you know that that I brought I brought a, a certain amount of pizzazz to his life and he brought a certain amount of solidness to my life so but anyway that was the turn one of the forks you know pretty well was getting married and then we mm -hmm. started thinking about having children and uh, you know that kind of thing mm -hmm. yeah, I can imagine what your life would look like have been on your own probably from it would have probably continued like you said it would have jumped from thing to thing to thing to thing you know what I mean it would have jumped all over yeah uh, and you know I don't know one of my one of my biggest things in life was becoming a mother. I really wanted to have a child, and it was a shock to me when we weren't getting pregnant, 
and three years went by and we weren't doing anything to stop it and and I wasn't getting pregnant so uh, we kind of got checked out and we found out that there was problems so uh, we were told that our chances of conceiving were very slim mm -hmm. and so we decided to adopt two children well, we didn't decide to do adopt two. We adopted one, and, and then uh, we wanted to have another one. And the first one was a girl, Genevieve. And, and then <clears throat> uh, a year and a half later, two years later, we applied again. And we were told, oh, usually you don't get a second one. But we didn't have too many restrictions as to what we wanted and didn't want. So... Um, uh, I'm kind of curious about that, not to interrupt you, but adoption, it seems like it's hard for people to adopt, but it, I, see, if, I imagine there's a lot of, not unwanted is the right word, but children without parents out there that are not. Mm -hmm. like I, I've worked in child welfare and you see how many times, you know, yeah. kids are not necessarily abandoned. But there's not that many people that, I mean, there are people that adopt, but there's more children up for adoption than there are people that are adopting so well, but they, I mean. they still have to it's done through agencies so they have to have a lot of legalities involved yeah. and a lot we were screened like crazy I, I wish they you know in a way people that have children naturally could be screened like that we had to answer tons of psychological questions and go to groups and everything in order to adopt but Anyway, we were very, very fortunate to get a, the sec, second child, that's Bridget. And, uh, and then when Bridget was um, a couple of years old, uh, I got pregnant. And it was like a miracle to me, you know, it really was. And I just thought, wow, this is unreal. So, and that was Sean. And, and then a year and a half later, I got pregnant again with Todd. And then, um, and then three years later, I got pregnant with you. Mm -hmm. And then three years later, I got pregnant with Julia. And I remember very, very distinctly laying in the bathtub with my big belly sticking out of the water with Julia. And I was nine months pregnant, and your dad came into the bathroom, and he said to me, I don't care what you say, I'm getting a vasectomy, and I went <laughs> high five. <laughs> I, I honestly say, out of my opinion, I, I think it's it, there's probably some m medical issue, and I going back to the brain. I always conceptualize things, but if they vasectomy guys when they were 18, and then when you decided to have a child, they could reverse it. Yeah. You yeah. Sometimes I mean? they can't. Like, like as sometimes a male birth they can't. Control. Yeah. Oh, sometimes they can't. What but you, you see, have semen frozen. You but know? you're what you're not for you. You're forgetting, Mark. Is I was in a different era, and I, I can and I won't say who, but an elder in our family saying to when I suggested, you know, because we were told you better guys better do something. That's five kids, you know, and when I was pregnant with you, but. Uh, you know, I said, well, he could always go for a vasectomy. And that was not very normal in those days. It was like the woman got her tubes tied. And the woman getting her tubes tied was a major surgery. And, I guess so. you know, so it was like, I, I'm not going to get into the, you know, the male thing. But it was like, a, Pretty. A, 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 like it was asking a male something that, you know, she shouldn't be asking them to get a vasectomy. It should, should be the woman in charge of that kind of thing, you know. That's quite old now, if you think about it, in oh, 80 yeah. years. Mm -hmm. That would have been over 30 years ago, so yeah. 40? Oh no, 30, 30 yeah, yeah, 30, yeah. So times have changed. No, yeah. no. Huh. Um, now you mentioned, and I'd be curious for you to expound on that, you said, I mean, you used the word God in, when you talking about you and Papa, and I know you've ascribed I don't know what, so hard to put a word on it now, religion, spirituality, God, belief in a higher power, but what was that about that? I've heard you often say that, you know, that that kept your relationship strong. Well, it, it, sur it, it? it, it surfaced the very first Christmas. We got married in, in April, and the very first Christmas we had a, a really bad fight on Christmas Eve, and... and uh, I don't even remember what it was about, to tell you the truth, but I remember we were in our little basement apartment and, you know, the gifts were under the tree and we weren't talking to each other and all this, and then I don't know who suggested, probably me, but 
that we pray together, and we did. Hmm. And there's something that happened. And, and we always, both of us, always sought out spiritual growth. We went through things like Curcio, Marriage Encounter. You know, we, we did, uh, uh, at one time, we did belong to a prayer group, you know. But it was, that was part of our relationship. And, and we, we're like anybody else, any other, other humans. We've had long periods sometimes of doubt and walking away from diff different things, you know, and, and as far as religion and then going back. And, but always finding uh, a comfort and a support in, um, in knowing that there's something bigger than us in our relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's helped us through a lot of things in our life. Mm -hmm. You hear that about a lot of people who stuck it out, huh? Mm -hmm. That's, I know myself in question a lot about relationships. You hear about a lot of people who you think, oh, wow, those two people look like they had it together 40 years and mm -hmm. they were at the brink many yeah. times. Yeah. It's very natural. And well, I think I think children see their parents and they think they're just kind of... Because I remember talking to your younger sister there, Julia, about that is... Um, you know, she named a couple in my family that they seemingly had the ideal marriage, and I went, you got to be kidding. Like, I'm not going to start spilling the beans here, but I almost walked out on them because they were fighting so much. But, you know, when we were with them for a period of time, and I said, what you, what you don't see, children see how their parents act, and they see that because they're around it all the time, and parents feel free to kind of bicker and stuff in front of their kids but a lot of people cover up in front of other people so what you see out there is not not reality really and most families have their their fights and most family have lots of tension and whatever but they you know if the if the basis of the family is love mm -hmm. well it gets back on track somewhere along the line, and I mean, you can attest to that, Mark. Well, we've had we've had situations yeah. in our family where I just went, "Whoa, you know, how is it ever going to get back on track?" And it always does. And and I have to say this: that your dad and I, every night, pray together for our family. You know, and that's part of our. We we share gratitudes together and of the day, and then we share our what we don't specifically say what. The, the child needs, we just put it in God's hands, but that they have happiness and health. Now, I was curious to ask you a question about, uh, you're talking about relationships and that, and fighting and stuff, and, and trials and tribulation. And as an outsider looking at your parents, as my grandparents, they always looked like they had a pretty Bonnie and Clyde, in the religious fashion, but mm -hmm. tight relationship, you know what I mean? They yeah. didn't look like they fought. They didn't look like that. Did Was that just my perception, or as someone seeing it from first-hand experience, did they have those challenges too? They did, but, yeah. uh, you know, they did have uh, a very uh, respectful relationship. I, I would have to say that when I look at my parents, like, they both had respect for each other. They might be really pissed off at each other, but they had they handled it in a respectful way. There was incidences, you know, where I saw and I heard. Uh, I actually, uh, you know, it's easy when you get older to start that, you know, because you don't have that. You have a lot of. Other things in your in your life that are hard to handle, like your health, your your uh, you know la sometimes lack of intimacy with your partner or whatever it is. But um, I had to talk to my own father about how he was talking to my mom at one point, mm. and I just said I don't like it. it. It's you've never been like that, and I don't like what I'm hearing, and I don't like what I'm seeing. You know, mm -hmm. and it was very hard for me to do that. But, uh, you know, we had been talking about it as a family way too long, like, you know. Oh, really? That long, right? Well, for, for months, I would mm. say. You know, and, and, he, and he did. He, you know, he, he, he was a humble enough man to take a look at it and curb it, you know. But it's very easy to get back into that. Um, I was just going to say Into a disrespectful. Or into a different attitude. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's added because you're kind of touching on the gratitude thing before how important it is to mm -hmm. Papa. And I find myself, I slip into a vein of criticism or condescension or, you mm -hmm. know, ego. Mm -hmm. And 
you can slip into that very fast and it becomes a pattern that builds yeah. upon itself and mm -hmm. builds upon itself. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I just, I, I'm very fortunate, very fortunate, and, and you know, because um, I, I don't want to talk about other people in a negative way, but I said to your dad, actually, last night, I said, I'm very fortunate that I was raised, you know, because your dad wasn't, and I, I'm not trying to bring them in, you know, that, but there's disrespect, and, I, and, and when you don't, when you're raised in disrespect, the way you talk to people, when you're raised in that, you don't even recognize it. It's like a denial system that happens. <laughs> I was just hearing it in my head. <laughs> Shut up! It works like that. Anyways. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's just, it, I said I was very fortunate and I'm ever so grateful that I was raised in a, like there was never I've never ever heard in my home like shut up or you know anything like that nothing there was nothing like that it was always you had to, but to the point that sometimes people didn't speak up either there's there's a point that you can get angry and say things angrily I, I always looked at anger like it was something wrong with it you know mm -hmm. so I was afraid of it and uh, I don't know I guess at this point in my life I don't I don't want to live in any type of fear. And and the other side of fear is trust and hope and love. Like and that that's what I want to move to. I don't I don't want to live like I don't know. The, you know this last year was very trying on on your dad and I in different ways and um, I came out of it very freed. Very freed. And I think what I got out of this last challenge that we had to face was um, that you 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 gotta there inside you inside you there you know that like this body I have and whether you're fat skinny whatever it is it doesn't really matter it I mean it matters that you keep responsibility for your body because it's, but it, because it's carrying your energy your soul it's carrying something and that's eternal that's eternal. Your body isn't. It rots and goes and it's gone. So it's really important to feed that soul. And that that's like Thomas Merton described it. It's a little spark inside of you. It's a little spark. Mm -hmm. and, and you need to go inside in silence, in meditation, whatever, whatever tool you use, you need to do that to get to that part because that's the part. That, that goes on eternally and that's the part that affects other people it's not my my body's not going to affect other people like mm -hmm. you know within you know like it's it's my energy and what i do with that spark inside of me like you know and and that's called like you know everything is moving to love and connection and if i live in fear well then i live in in a, a world of entrapment I, and then, and that that that's where you attach to things that really don't mean anything. Dick all in life, really. Uh, what's her name? Um, Kubler Ross. She worked with the dying, eh? and she said that in all the interviews or all the people she talked to, as they're laying on their deathbed in their last hours, none of them said, "Oh, I regret not buying that." Porsche, or oh gee, I regret not taking that job with the government, or oh, I regret. They all, if they had any regrets, it was about relationships and not loving enough. Mm -hmm. So, so to me, that's our goal in life. If you if you want to say goals, is to learn how to love, and if whatever it is that you have in your life, if it's teaching you and helping you to love better, well, then it's good, you know? It's mm -hmm. getting you into that I think realm. devil's advocate, though. I find people often conflate love with attachment. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. love, love can look like two things, you know? There's, like, the quote saying, like, if you see a flower and you love it, don't don't pluck it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because that's, that's possessive, right? And so it's a, it's a tricky balance what love really well, is. Well, Love is letting yeah. go sometimes too and not yeah. being holding on and well yeah and that's it you know people you know you you know I've gone to 12-step programs and you know I think everybody would do well with 12-step program but that that's what Richard Rohr calls, calls addiction he doesn't call it addiction he calls it attachments when we attach ourselves to something that we think we need 
mm-hmm. we need, you know. And, and nothing, nothing in life is permanent. Mm-hmm. Nothing. That's one of my mottos is nada es permanente. Nothing is permanent. So if I start attaching to my husband, if I start attaching to my children, I recognize it now and I go, let go. Mm-hmm. Because the minute you attach, then you take away your soul's purpose of truly loving. Mm-hmm. Yeah, attachment's an interesting thing. Now you said the word regrets, and that I, and I'm not looking off the list, but I remember looking as looking through the internet. Do you have regrets, or do you have anything that's unfinished that you still want to attain, or things that you wish you'd have done that you still have time to do? Because, I, because yeah. that's what really sparked this, and I, yeah. I've told you this before that, and it 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 really put up. A warmth and kind of a not a I wouldn't say a fear but a reality in my heart the last time we were eating dinner together and and what made me want to encapsulate this and ask you all these questions while there's still time everyone always just lives life and then shocked when that person's sick or that person's dying mm-hmm. but uh, it's a tough question but do you have regrets do you have things that you um, wish you had done or could do today was well, your last day <laughs> it's kind of deep but yeah, I don't know. Um, I think uh, one thing I would really like to do, you know, because you know, Mark, I do different art forms and art things, you know, and I, I really enjoy doing art. But the one thing I know, I know 100% that I'm a gifted writer and I really would like to write. And I, I can't seem to get off the ground on it because I want to know what my intention is in writing it. And... Part of it, part of it, I even get a lump in my throat when I say it is, I'd like to write a memoir because I feel that not not because of other people, probably their perceptions have, have formed this, what I'm going to say, but I feel that I've been greatly misunderstood in my life. Mm. And and not not because... Because I've also projected somebody that I'm not for many years of my life. Why did you think you did that? I don't want to lose that strange topic, well, but I want to get back to it. Why, why? I think a lot of us do yeah, that. Yeah, a do. lot of us do that. We, we, you know, I mean, here we go with the psychology thing, but 95% of our actions are subconscious. They're, mm-hmm. they're from childhood yeah. and the way we were Someone reared. makes fun of a haircut you had in the yeah. schoolyard and you think, oh, it looks stupid having my hair short, but as a woman I always wanted yeah. short hair and yeah. you never leave it that way. You or or, or, that or doing things or going to things and joining things and doing things, you want a sense of belonging and you want a sense of uh, uh, happiness or whatever. And so you're told as you grow up, that if you do, you, you know, there's certain formats in doing things, and um, it's it's hard. It's hard parenting. It's hard to. It's not just parenting. It's hard just being a human being and encouraging a person, because only that person knows. But in order to know, you need to be, do that other thing I was saying is become self-aware and, and go to that spark inside of you and say, what is it I really want here and need to do? Like, you well, know? Did, did 12 steps help with that too? You yeah, know, finding it, it the helped. Defects? It I helped. Find through the defects, finding the negative, you can almost retrace it back to where yeah. there's deep psychological yeah. hooks that are in there. Yeah, but you know, I, I mean, not not to... Um, not to misalign or whatever called the 12 steps but I found that it's it's run also by humans so there's human error there and I I feel this is my opinion but and I said I wasn't going to do this but is that um, there's too much emphasis on what you what you haven't done and the mistakes you've made like I I have found in the last six months a new freedom in myself and I, I don't feel like drinking. I don't feel like it doesn't. It's not like a thing that's it, because I've looked at the beauty inside myself. I've gone back to making my decisions for what what, what it, it's not a selfish thing. It's more 
a need I have to to honor who I am, mm -hmm. and so um, you know it's hard sometimes as a mom to do that. It you know to call us to all to honesty and saying you know like say if your friends want you to go out, you really don't want to go out. You know mm -hmm. that that happens to me sometimes. I I have more of a freedom now to say no, I really don't want to do that right now. I don't need that and enjoy yourself. You know, mm -hmm. it, but but the past me was more I wanted to belong so I would say yes because I go well if I say no too many times and they're going to ditch me well if they ditch me they were not meant to be and 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 that's another attachment again you know mm -hmm. so just to um I don't know the the freedom to to be yourself regret um I have to go back just to the Brad, writing. I want. Yeah, I know. That's why I want to bring it back to the writing because I was kind of curious. It's something you said, and I think you hit it on it yourself. And you mentioned Jesus in it, and how he how he spoke in parables because no one ever wants to hear a straight up opinion, right? Yeah. No one ever wants to be flat out told what anything is. I guess mm -hmm. people tune off right away. I, I I research and find the most amazing things that I think are the most mm -hmm. brilliant things ever that I found online. Can you believe if you put this in your body, MSG, it does yeah. this and this to your, your yeah. whatever and people tune right out. But if you tell a story, yeah. like, you know what I mean? So that, I would wonder what it would look like if you took those intentions of the things you wanted to say and, and hid them into really meaningful stories. Yeah, stories, yeah. That'd be neat. Yeah. You know, I I uh, regrets. I wish it's not so much, and and this is a touchy subject, Mark. But I wish I wouldn't have been sexually abused when I was eleven. I really wish that, but it changed my life because. Um, That's a or is that a regret though, or? Well, it's a it's a regret that. It's a yearning. I don't know that there would have been more available, and and my parents, whatever it was, a, a, a time that pedophilia was not understood or whatever, but um, it did change the course of my life so because that I don't U-turn moment or not U-turn fork in the road. Would you say that was almost probably oh, the biggest fork in the road? That was the biggest fork, yeah. Because I I lived in Saint Boniface. I had what they call you know the the perfect I, I mean it it was like a, a beautiful childhood like we lived on a block we knew all our neighbors uh, I loved my home my grandmother came over every day it was a cozy beautiful uh, we had family reunions my dad's family were all there like it, it was really a, a comfortable safe place for me and then my dad got a transfer which was supposed to be uh, for a year or two and it turned into a lifetime for, for different circumstances but we we came to Fort William and in that time there was a family uh, um, Perpetrator. A, a relative that came to stay with us and he was a pedophile and uh, that was in Thunder Bay? Yeah in Thunder oh, Bay. See, I always, I always interpreted no. the stories as that was in Winnipeg. No, no and so uh, at, at the peak of my loneliness wondering when you know we're, we're uh, in, in Thunder Bay is what like I say it was Fort William and we're in Fort William and I'm looking out my my living room window and there's blowing snow all over the place and I'm lonely and I'm missing my grandma because I was in some ways closer to my grandmother than I was to my own mother and missing and lonely but as a child you don't know all those feelings you just know you you feel uncomfortable and you don't really know how to talk about it and that that's when I started getting sexually abused so it, that put me into a, a frame of shame and secrecy if anybody ever found out about this because it was my grandfather so I I just thought that for whatever reason there was something you know, terribly wrong with me or something, and and uh, so I went into a, a oh, I hope nobody ever finds out about this, and uh, and then I discovered liquor at that age, 
mm-hmm. because my my dad ran a store. The feeling, but touch on the feelings part. That was mainly shame from it. The shame was, yeah, it, it was disabilitating. It was it, it caused me anxiety. Like at the minute I'd think about it, I, I'd go, ah! Like, and it was like an anxious feeling in my body, you know? So I got to get rid of that. So I learned to uh, do nonsense is what I call, mm-hmm. you know? I, I became a, a, a mischievous child, you know? Because it was a diversion from my feelings. And, and that got me in trouble in school. And then I started... Because and I never had low self-esteem until then, and and then I started be, becoming labeled as the troublemaker, you know, because I got I incited my fellow students to do all sorts of crazy things, so um, I I got in trouble and and you know and then I just I didn't care anymore. I think I, I those did, were active goals or cry for. Do you think you were? Because my I love this thing that I heard in psychology with especially working with kids like I do is they say usually when they have a big feeling in them they act them out. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So mm-hmm. and they try to create like you talked about subconsciously mm-hmm. before the ninety five percent. It was almost like. You wanted everyone's attention. You didn't want everyone to know, so you wanted everyone to know, kind yeah. of not really in a way. Yeah. That, you know what I mean by that? It's like yeah. it's almost you're hiding something so secretive that you're drawing. You're doing well, the opposite whenever, effect by you know, drawing like attention that, to yourself. That was one thing in the twelve step program. They would say your your secrets will keep you sick. You know, and and so that secret followed me and I started, I remember having, and I never had those in Winnipeg or St. Boniface, I never had nightmares. I don't remember ever having a nightmare, really. And um, I started getting horrific, horrific nightmares then, Mm. where I would scream for my mother, you know, I was 12 years old, 13 years old for my mother in the middle of the night. And uh, yeah, and just mix in religion with that. I thought the devil was after me. You know, it just it was it was a, a really tra- trauma time for me. Trauma time, and I've I've done work on myself in that area, and I know I know that that's the trauma. That's the trauma in my life that switched me into. Um, I hate that word codependency, but it switched me into taking care of other people and making sure they were okay. Mm-hmm. I, I became a, um, a person who took care of other people because I didn't want them to get hurt. I didn't want them to get hurt, you know, ever. And and I became a defender. And, oh, I, I would have beat up anybody that said anything bad about any of my siblings, you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it, it changed things because I was never like that. I was just, I was this kid, like in St. Boniface, that went to Falcon Lake every summer and just enjoyed the sunshine and the f- fun and games we did there and uh, and I, w- I, w- I was a loner too back then. I would go off into the forest and I'd come back with birch bark and make Indian, vi- oh sorry, First Nations uh, villages, <laughs> indigenous, whatever. Indigenous, I think is where we're at now. <laughs> is it? Is it? I think it's, it's not it. I don't know. I don't even know anymore. Oh it's, my god. Anyways. Well, in my childhood, we'd say Indian villages anyway. Yeah. But uh, I just, I love nature, eh? and I love being in it alone. And then we came to Fort William, and honestly, like, I love, this is my home now, but this is a, it still is, by the way, but not as bad as back then. It's a hard nut to crack. I'm telling you, you have, they, they had their cliques, they have people, like, it's like a, a city with a small town mentality. And you talk about try to fit in here. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to fit in here. And and that, you know, not to get on the native thing and, and you know, the, the refugee, or not refugees, but people that are coming here from other countries, I find my own self being prejudiced sometimes, mm-hmm. and I don't like it, you know. I, <laughs> you know, using words like, you know, that yes. I shouldn't have used yes. tonight, you know. But They're not malicious. No, not no, I just try. Clear, I just not try. throwing out N-words and stuff like that. <laughs> no. And there's a lot of political incorrectness. Yeah, but it's, you know, and, and the fact that I had one daughter that was First Nations or Indigenous, whatever, and you know, that that opened my heart up to the whole thing, and I did a lot of reading on it, and, you know, my, my heart really goes out to the, the Native population, and, you know, and I don't, I haven't got the answers. I don't know what the answer is. I know that they need self-empowerment. I know that they need to find the answers, and we don't, can't give them the answers, so, but... Uh, 
Anyway. Not to divert, yeah, but you're still on the topic of, of your grandpa and where where that took you with that. And did you ever, do you feel like you've processed that to the point where it's out of your being? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah because I, I, I totally understand he was a very sick man. He had, a, he, there was something, you know, there's something wrong. And I, I actually feel for people like that now because... Uh, you know, it was probably done to him. I don't really know. I don't know mm -hmm. his story, but um, can't be a fun life, I imagine, and living no, with that secret himself no. or those desires. Yeah, but, I don't but know, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I not think, fun, but maybe some mm -hmm. people don't revere it as bad. Or well, or, somebody asked me just recently, a couple of a month ago, about. They said, how come, and they were comparing me to somebody else, and they said, how come you've been through more than she has? Mm -hmm. You've had lots of tragedies in your life, and you you seem to be really happy. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I am happy. I said, I have my bad days, but I am generally happy. And they said, well, what's the difference? And I said, hmm, I would say denial. People who are not happy choose. Happiness is a choice. Mm. And, and when, when you choose to stay in dishonesty, when you, when you have a definite substance abuse problem or you have a sexual abuse problem. Sure, like you can say anything when you're in denial. If you're in yeah. denial, you're in the If you wrong have relationship. relationships, yeah. all, all of those things, if you, and you asked me before, you said, the 12 step, did it help you with that? And I said, yeah, it did, because I had to do a lot of introspection and say, you know, you know, a certain situation, well, what was my part in that? So that really helped me, bust me out of denial, you know, okay, take a look at this, quit blaming everybody else. But um, I think that people uh, stay in their unhappiness, like basically they stay in disease. Mm -hmm. And it can be depression, it can be any kind of disease, really, physical, mental, spiritual, anything, because they're in denial. And I said, I'm not in denial. I, uh, and, and I think I've shared that with you before, Mark, is Anthony DeMello, he's a really old Jesuit. He got kicked out of the Catholic Church, and then they took him back in. But um, <laughs> the Catholic Church has a habit of doing that. But anyway... Uh, he said, the day, and I, I, I'm just saying, it's not verbatim, but it's pretty well what he said. He says, the day that you admit you're a mess and everybody else is a mess, that's the day you move forward. Mm -hmm. And that, that's my thing in life is I have been able to show people that I'm vulnerable. Like, and, okay, so well, you... Belly is dangerous, though, I find a little bit. It opens yourself up to attack. Do you find that? Like you said, you've yeah. often been misunderstood in your life. Exactly. You've been criticized. They come, in your everything life comes with because, two sides. Because when you open yourself up, yeah. it, it allows for that attack to come in, right? Well, exactly. It makes people, in my opinion, feel threatened. Yeah. You know, because because their denial is 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 met now in yeah. themselves. You know, it's like say you've ex probably experienced this with your non-drinking. You go somewhere with not drinking at a party, and people start saying, "Hey, what do you think? You don't need a drink. You're better than you know." People get their backs up against the wall almost. Yeah that denial factor because or they sit down with you and confess all about their drinking <laughs> <laughs> I don't care what people do anymore because I'll be really honest that's one thing that turned me off a little bit in the 12-step program is you're supposed to avoid people that are drinking and drugging I don't because you know what it's not really about giving up that it, yes it helps it really helps to leave lead an emotionally sober life if you give up a substance that you're attached to. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. But th some of those people, like, they're, they're just as good as I am. Like, you know, it's just that they haven't maybe had the opportunities, the graces in life I've had. Mm -hmm. the, the people, I, they did, you know, I, I honestly, I had fantastic parents and, you know, well, you knew grandpa and grandma. And I was going to say, they, I, they, I, they, I they had a question. You, you, you attribute your grandma. You, you, you speak a lot about her and that. But I was kind of curious to ask you that. You th would you say you're closer to your mom or your dad? Or was it equal? Oh, or was it? I was closer. I was, I was closer to my mom. I, okay, let's put it. I was more comfortable with my mom. Okay. I felt more accepted by my mom. Because 
at this time in my life, I realize so much how much I'm like my dad, that I wish he was alive so I could talk to him because I know now where his mind's at. Like, I know... But I wouldn't admit that I was like him back then. So it was like fighting myself with him, you know? Because he was very opinionated. I could be very opinionated. And um, I've curbed that. I've curbed that because I know that it, it doesn't really matter. You don't change the world with opinions. You change it by examples. That's Anthony DeMello. No, that's Paulo Coelho. Or the, the Paulo guy. Coelho. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, is. The Alchemist. Yeah. Uh, that's my favorite book. Uh, I was going to ask you something, but back to your dad and the... Oh, jeez. So, I so okay, I but with, with the sexual abuse thing, okay, mm -hmm. so then, then it stopped, and then, but I still had that cloud over me and everything, and, and uh, it caused a lot of confusion sexually for me through high school and everything, but uh, I, I don't know. It, a lot of people don't understand sexual abuse, so, you know, it, it's not something you can go talking to people about, but it's, if anybody has, you know, I always, I always share that part of my story because it's really important to get help with that. Well, it's like, it's in, especially in the West, we talked about in child and youth work, just the differences in society, say a nude mm -hmm. beach, and this is, I'm going to go off on a little tangent and come mm -hmm. back to it here, but like say a nude beach in Europe, like they don't look at the body as, as, as sexual as we do there, you know, like mm -hmm. there be people walking around mm -hmm. naked, families, mm -hmm. you know, people, and it's not like, oh, look at, let's stare the whole time, yep. but it's really repressed here in the West, right, you know mm -hmm. what I mean, to the point where people are almost wearing practically nothing now, you know, to, to look sexualized where it's because it's so repressed, I find. Mm -hmm. yeah, everything's become hypersexualized and or repressed. So, uh, I was losing my train of thought where that was going, but what would your advice, I guess, be to that in that sense? Because it, it's a topic that's it's all across the board. I think it's probably, I'd say, one in four girls, probably more, um, that it's affected by that. So, where, where, where people go from that? Where well, there's they go more than human? that, yeah. Yeah, well, right. I know that, that's the, like... And one in three men are pedophiles. That's the statistic? Well, I think it's gone up to two now. It's, it's crazy, but uh, yeah, it is. And, and, and people think that, um, no, 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 sorry. That's, that's sounds, a wrong that's, statistic. I was going to say, that's one not, out, like One out of million. three pedophiles, or two out of three, I can't remember, because I told you, I, I, I'm really bad on statistics. But, <laughs> but one or two out of three are married men because all oh, they always say about the priest oh, oh they should let them get married maybe that wouldn't happen it's got nothing to do with it it's 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 a society that has been it's escalating in okay pedophile pedophile is um philia is not about getting your rocks off it's about power and control know, it's funny the and it's like rape it's the same thing mm -hmm. so people don't understand that it's got nothing to do with that so it, it, our whole society is teaching people to have power and control mm -hmm. you know and, and and i don't know you know and, and we were talking earlier about technology let's go on that tangent. no no but and that's, no, no, we're all over the place right now but I, that's the counselor that i i speak with he just talked about that and i was blown away and fascinated by it what he was talking about. I don't know how we got on that tangent too. I think we we're talking about the occult, you know, how I'm a big conspirator and I like to look into everything, you know, conspiracy. But he said perpetrators, they, they are generally heavily involved in, in, in areas like that where they have positions of power and trust. Mm -hmm. And they're usually lone wolves. They're very yeah. secretive in that sense and yeah. it's, it's very hidden. So just a little interesting tip. Yeah. Um, so... You know, so that I carried that all, and, and basically, I would say from, and I'm not going to go into all the deep therapy I had or whatever, but I, I, I gave up. I gave up. I thought, you know what, it's freaking easier to just have a good time than to put some work into anything. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't think I was worth it, you see. That's what sexual abuse does. It, it, it fills you with shame, and it tells you, there's something wrong with you, whatever, you know. So um, I just, I, I don't blame my parents for not putting me in the right high school. I don't blame anybody anymore. But I do know, if you said, back to the original question, any regrets, like I would, 
I don't know if that's your original question. I think that's the start, the fork in the road. <laughs> but I just, um, I, I wish I could have had, I wish, I don't know, and you know, like that's why I'm so uh, uh, adamant about bringing that, like talking about that with children or something, you know, or sometimes I'm a little too paranoid. I mean, it has affected me. I see an old man walking down the street holding a little kid's hand, and the first thought I think is, I wonder if he's diddling with that kid. Like it has affected me mm -hmm. in my perception of things, you know. But I do recognize it now, and I just go, okay, don't go there, you know. But, um, yeah, but anyway, I, I always, I think... Um, I think an important vein that you're going down with talking about that is the addiction piece, too. Well, yeah. How, you, how people cover up stuff well, with other you, things in their life, yeah. whether it be addicted to their work, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, addicted to yeah. food, to whatever, to mask To feelings, anything. And, right? and you know Gabor Mate, he, he says that, eh, that all addiction is trauma-based, eh? Mm -hmm. And, he, and he, he's firm on that, you know, and I agree with that. I agree with it, and I think that sometimes... Uh, See, that's what... I don't know. I, I'm, I'm really curious about that, though. Because there was this kid that I dealt with in treatment, and I don't think it's... There's no confidentiality crossing and talking about this, but he was really perplexed because he just said, like, I don't... I came from a really good family. I didn't have anything bad happen. He was just bored. Boredom was his trigger. Like he just said, I, I, I don't really have any deep underlying passions that I want to pursue. You know what I mean? I just got into it because my friends were going out and do drugs and said, I'll try it. And I thought it was fun. And, mm -hmm. and then I tried it again and it was mm -hmm. fun. And I tried a third time. And, you know, and all of a sudden I'm in that cycle of, of use well, and abuse. Well, okay, you know? but... He might have been, there might have been stuff there that wasn't Well, no, no, but the boredom piece, Mark, is what... And, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to go down that road of talking about the education system, but the education system is failing our kids. I really feel that strongly, okay? And if you look at the fin, Finland model of education, like, it's so different than ours. And, and people start school off, kids start school off, where they're looked at and say, what's their strengths, what's their weaknesses? Like, they, they, they work on their strengths rather than clone them all into you do this you do this you do this and and it's maybe not the kid you know See, I have so a different, uh, i have a different theory in that from working in the school system but, yeah because I, I i myself have been really hard in the school system with your exact thought you know it was it was developed by the german military to you know mm -hmm. create soldiers it was at the turn of the industrial revolution where they needed factory workers so they needed people smart enough to work the machines yada yada we've all heard the mm -hmm. well maybe we all haven't heard that but that was the general consensus. A lot of people say, you know, make people smart enough to work the machines, but not smart enough to question the establishment, to want change. You know, I think it comes down to the breakdown of the two-parent family, personally. I think it's, yeah. I, I think it's, it's the responsibility of parents. I think if, if kids were coming home every night to two parents who were sitting them down and saying, what's your homework? You know, what do you have to work on? What are you doing? What are you working in? I think the school offers several veins of art history, of, mm -hmm. of mathematics, of language. And that's the parents' job to hone and see that in the children. And well, I, I, all, I, I say that societal's breakdown, 100% in my opinion, I, I'm pretty firm on this because I've looked at it a lot, is the lack of, especially a male in the house. You know, it's easy for a guy to get a girl pregnant and then take off, right? And then a mom's now single with a kid, and now she's got to raise it. She's got to work extra. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have the extra time to put in the kid. The kid's not in extracurricular activities. He's not supervised as much. He's not getting that affection he needs from the mother, that whatever he needs from the father, you know? Mm -hmm. I, 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 that's my personal Well, belief. you know, uh, I, I wouldn't want to go back. Honestly, I wouldn't want to go back to... Uh, you know, the era where I was part of, because I was a stay-at-home mom, mm -hmm. and it was evolving then where women were more and more getting out into the, a career and getting their kids into daycare that, at that point. And I was... I was criticized a lot for making that choice, mm -hmm. but I don't regret it. I do not regret doing that at all, because... Uh, and I'm not saying I was the savior or anything. Your dad was a really responsible person when it came to his career and 
and making sure that the home run and everything and I was the person at home that m met the kids when they came you kids when you came home from school and and asked you stuff and played with you and whatever I did okay I I could I could do that and and people say to me yeah well you we can't afford to do that now no you can't because you got a freaking new car out in the front and you've got a 60 inch television and everything and I and I I've, I've, I've took told you this spiel, you know, we were so excited after 10 years of marriage and children and everything, we, we had, we bought a 13 inch color TV and we thought we had gone to heaven. Like there's none of that now. People, yeah. people get married and they've got a, a house already. We rent, lived in rentals for a while. Like, I don't know. It's just a different world. It's a different world, but that sense of family, Mark, that's what I'm hearing you say. Mm -hmm. There's a sense of family, and Grandpa St. Marie used to talk about that a lot, mm -hmm. the breakdown in family. And we have that in our family. Mm -hmm. And again, your dad and I are sitting in the hot tub two, two or three nights ago saying, there is no way in hell our family would have ever survived if we didn't have that strong foundation of family. Mm -hmm. We believed in family, and a lot of people don't. They, they, you know, well, it's evident in the divorce rates and everything else that's going on, you know, but uh, children are, are I, I can't get over the difference, and, and I love my grandchildren, and I love children, period, and that's another thing, loving children. I think a lot of people are looking at children now as pets, like, you know, like mm -hmm. they're... It, it's, I don't know. They're, they're well, they're looking at it as a responsibility because of the new lifestyle, I would think, and we're, we're doing what we said we wouldn't do. <laughs> Theoriticizing and philosophizing and, di and diversifying. But, okay, so... But no, I, no, it's just, it's interesting, though. It's, it's the consumer generation, and you, everything you said there, I'm guilty of, and I hate it because I work seven days a week, and I work my ass off, two yeah. jobs, because I went and lavishly, impulsively got that new car, and, and I got the, the bought the house and, and, yeah, and it's all time and place it's pretty age appropriate for my age but it's living outside one's means and and I have to live up a certain lifestyle not to in order to keep that and then you throw a kid in the mix where someone's got to stay home and now you gotta you know mm -hmm. do those responsibilities it's tough yeah it, it it's is tough it is person. tough but it's a different world like you know what I was thinking was uh, you know the, not not to get off on the technology thing but you know um, Whereas before, you, you would phone Uncle Uncle Joe or whatever knows how to do woodwork, you know. I'm going to phone him, okay. What do people do now? And I'm guilty of it too, you know. They'll pay. No, oh, oh they might pay, but they go on the on their YouTube. Let's see how you hook this up instead of phoning Uncle Joe. You know, or, or, you know, my wonderful neighbor Aldo, you know, instead of turning to him, which we have, and we've developed such a nice relationship with him, mm -hmm. you know, he's like a relative to us because he fixes things for us. Well, it makes it that's family, mm -hmm. like when you rely on each other, but now people go on their phones for everything. Well, it's interesting, Sean. Gave, I, don't, I don't think I said this to you. My brother Sean gave me a nice compliment about our neighborhood when he was helping Julia, my mm -hmm. sister, move two doors down. And my neighborhood, I have a stepdaughter, Miley's 10, and, and Amanda, no, maybe rightfully so, says, I don't want her outside by herself. I don't, it, this neighborhood's dangerous. It's, mm -hmm. it's unsafe, you know what I mean? It gets all those labels because it's lower income. But man, lower income still lives in that. He, that's where the compliment came in from Sean. He said, we are moving in Julia. And he said, I met all of your neighbors. Yeah. I met, you know, the person on yeah. both sides and besides her and above her. Yeah. And it, it's the same for us. We know them all by name. Yeah. I could tell you where they all work. But you know what? That That's a whole big point there. Like consumerism divides people. Like it, it, the more you buy and the more you keep your little nest. Like I, I gave your dad an example. You know, he, he wanted to buy a snowblower. Mm -hmm. And I said, why don't you use all those? But he wanted his own. And I'm not saying that's bad, bad, bad. It's, I don't mean it that way. But, like, what's wrong with sharing things? Mm -hmm. Like, we're, we're, we've gotten... And, and that makes somebody feel good if sometimes, you know, unless they're really 
coveting their stuff and they don't want to share it you know you get you you learn pretty fast who, who wants to do that and who doesn't eh? but you know the the neighborhood we lived in mark on franklin street how how unique that people would want to move there they'd say to us all the time if ever there's a house that comes for sale in your neighborhood let me know because they knew what a fantastic mm -hmm. neighborhood we had of connection and everything you know mm. i wonder if it'll seesaw back to that it might. it might. I don't know. You Who know. Knows. Once it gets inside of us, that technology, we're done. Eh? <laughs> uh, but no, to get back to some more pertinent stuff, yeah. meaningful stuff about your life, in doing this conversation, you know, trying to tease out some things you would ask, you know, morbidly before someone passes away or whatever, you know what I mean? But your dad, and you, you said, and you, you mentioned him a couple times, and what it would be like talking to him now. Do you have things that you hold inside you that you'd want to you can't say to your parents but would have wanted to still like do you have leftover things or things you would have wanted to ask or say oh i just i i would have like my aunt annette you know that's my dad's sister is still alive and she's 102 she's going to be 103 in january and she's totally totally cognitive and everything and she tells me history in the family I love to go visit her because I love to get all of that stuff eh? and I, I find out stuff from her and then I understand myself better because I know where I came from you know I I, I, I don't know I have a pride there's a pride there and but with my dad yeah I would ask him those kind of questions you know like um, not so much history but more about him when he was a kid I, I, I we used to talk more like I, I don't know like I knew that he you know they were so poor that he had two left shoes or something like that you know and I know that they loved Christmas time because they got Japanese oranges with the green paper on it and that meant they had toilet paper you know mm -hmm. like uh, you know that was from welfare they got the oranges from but you know just the different things like that and I just uh, I don't know I just I, I wish I could ask them yeah I wish I could ask them those kind of questions and uh, I, I think that sometimes we, we look at our parents you know, I, I looked at my parents like I took them for granted. <clears throat> and um, I don't know, I just, I, I think I would show more appreciation and spend more time with them. I, I did spend a lot of time with them, but I would even spend more time with them. Like, I just love spending time with people now. I, you know, uh, I, I just recently finished a group of women where we studied archetypes and, and uh, all this stuff and you have to kind of, it's Carl Jung philosophy and I won't get into that, but anyway, uh, one of the things I said I picked out as one of my archetypes was being a good mother. And I shared with the group that um, I've heard famous people, I've heard, I've gone to wonderful retreats, conferences, you name it, I've done it in my life. And uh, none of those things affected me as much as my grandmother and my uncle Ray. Hmm. None of them. Like, and, and it was it listening to somebody up there tell, uh, you know, be rah-rah on the ecology or be rah-rah on finding your soul and all this stuff? No, mm -hmm. it wasn't that. It was, it was being, those two people were present to me. Mm -hmm. They were present to me, you know. And, and that's the sad part is sometimes parents are so caught up in the children and other things and whatever that they're not present. And so at this point in my life, I'm embracing that I'm getting older and I want to be present to people. Mm -hmm. And I realize a lot of my life I wasn't really present to people. That's a good good point. I, I teach it with the kids at Smith. We do an exercise. And I paid for one of those, you know, $350 for a weekend retreat. I think mm -hmm. it was at the Body Mind Center. And it was the retreat was really good. Did a lot of amazing things, but couldn't tell you most of what we did besides the first activity. And it was exactly that. It was five minutes. And you're the recipient and I'm the speaker. And you don't get to respond. You just mm -hmm. be present to the person. 
and you would think it would create a lot of anxiety in people, but you should have seen people, like five minutes was still going and people were still talking. You know, you get a moment of yeah. awkward silence where you yeah. go, oh, what do I say here? What do I say? Okay, and I'll just talk about, but you just jibber jabber and it was the aha moment for me. I went, holy shit. I've never been really listening to people. Mm -hmm. It was like this big mm -hmm. aha moment and I got it in five minutes and it's exactly what you're touching upon is that presence. How many times is someone telling you something that it might be something really important to them yeah. and you don't know that because you got, oh man, I got to rush to work and we're going to double and I got to pick up the whatever, pizza on the way home and someone's telling you something and you're going mm -hmm. or you're thinking about what to say to them to respond or your ego wants to as they're telling you something you pick up on something interesting in there and you want to cut them off even doing this has helped me for just letting yeah. people tell a story so that's well, a good I, one. I, I think too that people think listening is just um, it sometimes it's hard to listen because the person might be angry or, or, or saying things that you you don't like. Mm -hmm. That's when it's really important to listen. Because behind those words are always something. And, and I just have a little quick little story. Uh, your dad and I got into this argument. This is about a month ago. And we were both looking at buying something that we shouldn't be buying. You know, is that another motorhome? <laughs> no, 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 it wasn't the motorhome. It wasn't the motorhome. No, no, I know you're joking. Uh, no, it was a, a, a trailer out at Lac de Malac of all oh. places. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, they were asking thirty nine nine, and guess what? It's reduced now to fourteen nine. But anyway, uh, so anyway, they <laughs> sidetrack. But anyway, we were looking at this, and and. Your brother came over, Sean, and, and and he goes, yeah, mom wants to buy this trailer. And I'm looking at him. I'm going, what is he doing? Like, he's the one that pointed, you know. So it would just, it became like I, I got my back up, eh? And after Sean left, I said, well, why did you do that? Why did you blame me? Like, you're, you were just as interested in buying that trailer. He says, no, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. And, and we got into an argument. So I just said to him, you know what? I, I don't like what's happening here. I don't know. I can't put my finger on it, but I don't want to talk anymore. And I, I just walked away. And you know that he went to the gym the next morning and he came back and he said, I, re I said, I want you to think about what you just did. And, and, and I'm not trying to say this to point out to him, you know, but it was an, an example of, I said, there's something behind you blaming me and I want you to look at it. So he looked at it and he said, I'm afraid. I'm afraid we're going to make some big stupid mistake. Well, that meant so much to me. You see, that's honesty. That humility piece. Well, well yeah, honesty. but it's, it's, it's honesty. And, and often we get into arguments with people or we, especially in spousal stuff, eh? Like you, you, you get your back up and everything and you're not really listening to what the other person's saying. And sometimes you can't meet their need. You know, but you, you, you need to acknowledge what they, they're really saying. Like, you know, I don't know. It's just, I, I've been able to do that more. And, and I, I wish I would have learned this years ago in my marriage. Mm -hmm. But I'm doing it more now. And, and it brings more peace into a relationship. Mm -hmm. Way more peace. So, yeah. Well, that's what you said years ago. And that's another conceptual question I had in my head. Yourself, 40 years ago. Or 30 years ago, what yeah. would you tell yourself? Advice? That's to live in the moment, which I've always been able to do. I'm, I'm proud of that part of my character. Sometimes it's a little bit too much living in the moment, not planning. But um, what, would I, what would I say to myself 30 years yeah, ago? Yeah, like what advice would you give to yourself 30 years ago? Or to people now? To, to believe in myself more. Never mind. I, I went way too much on what other people thought of me. Mm -hmm. Way too much. Like, uh, you know, somebody would say something like, you know, whatever. Oh, that one, she never, uh, you know, she whatever. Say something negative about me. And I would, oh, geez, maybe I am like that. And, oh, I hate them and all this. And now I just go, frick them, you know. That's like. Fair. <laughs> no, I'm not swearing. I'm, I'm on a new trend now. I'm trying not to swear. But no, I just said, you know, it, I, I think in my art room downstairs, I have 
three pictures. I have one when I was about two, and I have one when I was about eight, and another one, I think I'm five or something, but they're all, and a therapist had told me to do that. Put, put pictures of yourself when you're young. Mm, I've heard of that. Yeah, and you know, sometimes I'm, I meditate down there, and um, you know, I, I, I get back to that person because before the world affected me, we're all like, you know, I don't want to get off on a philosophy, but we're all affected as we grow up and everything. And, oh, yeah. and so that's that 95% subconscious that tells you to, to do things, you know. I think someone's there, Jeremy. Do you want to go check that out? Somebody's sure. knocking. Someone's knocking quite intensely on the door. I can't see that being Matt. <laughs> doing a coded knock. I feel like, is it Andrew? Anyway. Yell, yeah. Jeremy, if you're in danger, we will come. <laughs> I know Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I'm a purple belt. <laughs> I'll talk to them. <laughs> I'll show them about love. Hey. <laughs> uh, oh, it is Andrew. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's, he's, he's coming, coming here? He's coming in. <laughs> oh, boy. This is my big... You're ruining it. You're Come ruining on, it. Come on, Andrew. <laughs> it's one of those days that so it's, oh, it's living in the moment. Andrew. Hey, look who's on the podcast. Do Come on in. Get in here. Get in here. Get in here. Right now. <laughs> How's the weather looking? I told you you should interview your mom. I know. We had to, we had a gap spacing to fill, and I, I yeah. wanted to double this with, you're on with shooting right the promo. should be the feature. <laughs> It's amazing. I was just leaving we, work, so yeah, I thought I saw your Mark, car. I know. We it's so funny. Like I thought it was. I thought it was tonight. one of the neighborhood people because we set off the alarm and people were like, "Oh, what's going on out here?" And people were yelling. So I was like, "Oh, it's the awesome. people are back." What are you up to? You can. I gotta run home. Actually, I gotta put my daughter to bed. So I just oh, thought. Uh, uh, I just thought I'd say hi. I, I heard Mark, no, Mark no told me. Mark told me what a good daddy you are. Oh, did he? Nice. Yeah. yeah. We were just talking with her right before we came here. She's asking. I was like. Good. And he's a very dedicated Yeah, awesome you could sit father. and watch. You could be the our audience. You know what I would normally, <laughs> but I got to I actually I'm hoping. What's the weather look like? I'm hoping to get the it's intro raining. shots. It's still raining. Yeah, I wouldn't do it today. No? No, it looks good though. I know. That's why I rocked it tonight for you. Awesome. Looks good. We'll get it done. Handsome devil. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for popping by, Andrew. Nice to, see you. <laughs> nice to see We're you. We're going to leave this in here. I can't here. wait to listen to this one. <laughs> see you, Andrew. Oh, that's funny. Oh, wow. boy. If, if, you know what that reminded me of? What? 233 North Franklin Street. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I should tell the story or not. But it reminded me of Andrew barging in. Not the plug toilet one, hey? Eh? No, that was me. <laughs> um, we had a friend who bartended at the Fort William Curling Club mm -hmm. just down the way, you know? It's on Vickers, and we live on Franklin. Mm -hmm. And 8.30 in the morning, that door's going bam, 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 bam. Exact same thing is happening. And I go, what the hell is going on down there? You're going to wake up. It's probably one of my friends. is going to wake up everyone in the house. So I run downstairs. And it's sure enough, it's Andrew. He comes running in, and he says, "I woke up in the curling like, I woke up in the curling club, and the alarm went off. I guess he tripped oh. the motion sensors because he was there with the whole yeah, gang yeah. the night before. Mm -hmm. And I guess in the night's festivities, ended up falling asleep in one of the chairs. So when he woke up, the alarm was going off. <laughs> so he ran all the way to the house because the same situation probably would happen. You yeah, know, like, let happen yeah. outside of Westford here. The Lots police came. Lots of things but, happened at two thirty-three. Eh? Yeah, we we're yeah. talking. Uh, that's a side note, but Julie and I were talking about that house. There was, there was weird mojo in that house. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm a spiritual person, and I think there was some, well, there was some spirits you know, around in there. There was, there was a lot of uh, challenges and tragedy that happened to our family there. Yeah, yeah I think sure. that stuff can build on that, too. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. We found out that years before we... The people before us had bought it off a doctor who had a daughter who was very sick, and she lived on the third floor. Eh? Mm -hmm. She Remember died you? in the house. Yeah, I think and so. And Sean and Todd said they used to see a girl up there. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> 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 um, so maybe we'll cover a couple of topics. Probably get what time you got there, just out of curiosity. Uh, I don't have my watch, my glasses on. Oh. Let me see. Okay. I think it's ten after eight. Is yeah. it?
for dinner. That's not too bad. Um, we'll, co we'll cover a couple more things that I want to ask you. Um, well, we were kind of on that where I said, what would you advise, I guess, for people now? You said live, it kind of coincides with what you were talking mm -hmm. about before I came, but like living in the moment is would be your advice or what would you pass on to kids? I guess the world's going to be changing very much by the time, you know, 20 years pass. Yeah. But Well, I think acceptance, I think, I, you know, I always talk about that, but accepting situations and people and things the way they're supposed to be like not not so much try to change them but accept them and that doesn't mean become a doormat that doesn't mean you know uh whatever don't be silent don't say anything it doesn't mean that it just means accept and there's a big difference when you accept something oh okay okay yeah you know like if you can acceptance for me is when i separate from the other person and the situation that's not me like that's there it's out there it's not me like when i make it part of me well then i attach myself to it and then it becomes you know where uh i take on all those feelings and whatever you know but acceptance is a big one um self-awareness uh, when I was very young, my Uncle Ray, um, you know, and, and, and to, to, to counteract the pedophile grandfather, he was a beautiful man. He was a Roman Catholic priest. This is, this is not your grandfather you're speaking of, because it kind of sounds like you're on the same... No, this my uncle, uncle Ray okay. was a Roman Catholic priest, and, you know, he, he taught me what a real man was, and he gave me a lot of affection, and he gave me a lot of encouragement. And Is he aware of your situation? I don't know. You don't know? Because we never talked about it. We, mm -hmm. the only I popped it out of the bag when I was 30 years old. And, <laughs> You know, uh, to my mom and dad, but uh, but yeah, I don't know. Um, he he said to me, and I can still see myself sitting with him. He said, "You know that you have way more self awareness than anybody I've ever seen at your age." I was a teenager at that time, mm -hmm. and I always did, and I always had that quest. I always had that quest, that spiritual quest to figure myself out, to figure things out. And uh, one, one of the best, best books I ever read, my dad gave me to read, was The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. And, you know, later on, people plagiarized it and called The Power of Now or whatever. What's that called? Power of Now is yeah. the most current You know, it's all, it's all based on that, you know, mm -hmm. except that the, the uh, power of positive thinking had a, a Christian spiritual bent to it, but yeah, but um, it, it's just to to think positively, to live in the moment, to accept, because uh, if you don't, you might as well shoot yourself. <laughs> well, you would seriously. Oh, wow. That's you know that before. read, re, listen to the song. You know how you, things that have gotten me through in life is music. You asked me that before, but music, um, my sense of humor, mm -hmm. that is crucial to me. And that I grew up with that sense of humor. We love stories. We love to laugh. And sometimes it, it was a little over the top like you know we would start laughing like we'd laugh at funerals like my grandmother died and and the one I, I love dearly and we we go to the to, to the coffin and and we're all like my mom and her daughters and my brother are all around the coffin and we're looking at her and she's got her glasses on and somebody said why she got glasses on so it started as kind of laughing and then I bent down and kissed her, and I said, oh, my God, she's really cold. And my mom said, well, they just took her out of the freezer. And we just couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> and everybody thought we were crying up there because we're going like this, you know, and they can just see our backs, and we're all, like, trying to hold in the laughter and laughing. But that's one thing I grew up with, lots and lots of laughter. And that's so important in life. Like, not to take things too, too seriously, you know, like... You know, it's hard sometimes because life gives you stuff and you know the stuff we were given. I lost my, my grandson, my very first grandchild, 
I lo I lo he died at five years old of cancer and uh, he was living in our house at the time. Um, that was very hard and uh, you know different deaths in between there but but especially my 30 year old daughter and your sister was full term pregnancy and had a freak heart attack and we lost both her and the baby three days later they were on life support and uh, things like that challenges that came our way that uh, people and and there's more more to the story. I, I I don't divulge any confidentiality in saying Bridget's story because she's on the internet and speaks all over the world now. Um, she, she's actually going to Budapest in September to speak. Really? But, yeah. Wow. And um, so anyway, she um, she went down a road of prostitution or street work and. Uh, came out of it after her son died, my, the grandchild that I lost, and uh, and uh, turned her life around. And, you know, there's a lot of really good stuff in the world. But anyway, what I'm getting at is um, I think that if I could say anything about our family and about me is I'm resilient, and you, you kids have all been really resilient through a lot of stuff. And that hasn't made you that's made you a good person and it's because of the choices you guys have made like all the choice like like people will hear our story sometimes and go holy cow like how did you guys do it i don't know how we did it but i do know that we laugh i oh, do I know i can say drugs and alcohol helped me out for a lot of years and and it helped me yeah. out too mark mm -hmm. but i mean then you know what 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 i thought was a friend and a help became uh, pulling me down so mm -hmm. I, I that's why I decided and I don't judge anybody that and I've seen people in recovery look back on their use and they don't even look at it negatively they say that that, mm -hmm. that was great that I had that. yeah that, that was my friend that that I needed no that, I needed that that, that was my band-aid that, that yeah. kept the wound sealed you know exactly so. exactly you know and I think you know I, I think we're going we'll, we'll forever have addiction in our world like that's part of human being being a human you know if but I mean I'm not going to get into the world thing but um yeah, but anyway, it, it, it's it's resiliency and and learning to laugh and not take things too seriously and um, uh, I don't know. Just I, like I can't even say enough on these last six months or so in my life how they've done to me. They've made me accept like like I I you know I've I I was just went camping with a girlfriend. In, in the states there just I bought another motorhome but anyway uh, <laughs> um, which number is it <laughs> number seven number lucky seven, seven mark <laughs> but anyway um, I looked over at her at one point she was talking I looked over at her and her her cheeks were all wrinkled here you know and then I, I went I wonder you know and I looked in the mirror and I went oh my god where the frick did those wrinkles come from you know what happened where did that come from and then something happened to me and I went yay yay here I am with my old lady friend and we're still camping we're still having fun you know and that's the point like don't give up like just every family has troubles um, I don't think you should judge your troubles as worse than other people like I remember losing my daughter and um how horrible it was and losing my grandson that I thought God was replacing my first grandson with and all that stuff but um, oh I lost my train of thought anyway it, no, just, it, I think imparting help to other people is where you're, you're getting at it, it, what imparting help for other people yeah and and not giving up like don't give up don't give up like that's you know sometimes you want to give up but don't give up it's it's just part of life it's part of human suffering like that's part of being human you gotta you know you try to make the world better and but always come from a place of love and not fear I, that's my biggest biggest thing is what I got this last because uh, you know sometimes things get totally out of control in your life and you see things in your children that are totally out of your control and and to just hope I carried a rock in my pocket for a long time the last six months and it had the word hope on it and uh, you, you have to hope 
Because if you give up hope, like I said, you might as well shoot yourself because it's, it's not fun. It's, you live in anxiety, you live in anger, you live in resentment. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't like living in resentment. When, when I live in resentment, I just had one just recently, last week. And, um, <laughs> and uh, when I live in resentment, it's because I'm living in, in an expectation. Like I'm living in, in an expectation of what I think should be, and I'm not trusting. I'm not trusting at all that that's the path of... I always remember my old aunt saying to me, the one that's 100 and almost 103, she said, you know, she questioned her... She was the second oldest girl in a family of 10. And that's my dad's sister. And when she was younger... Like, her father was the pedophile guy, so he, he hardly worked. She had to go out and work, and her older sister got to stay home because she wasn't, like, she was sickly, you know. Not sickly, but she had a blood thing or whatever, and she, she just stayed home. But everybody, her name was Irene, and the 103-year-old now is Annette. And Irene, the sun shone and set on Irene. Everybody loved Irene. Like, they just thought she was the cat's meow, you know? And meanwhile, Annette's going out and bringing the only money home to buy groceries. You know, she's 15 years old, and Annette, and Irene's 17. And she's basically keeping the house going, and she's getting no recognition, she said, you know? But then she realized when... Irene was 41 or 42, she died of cancer. Like, that was God's way of saying, here, here's your time. She says, now, look at all my nieces and nephews. They, like, a lot of them flock to her. Mm -hmm. and, and Not I, comparing yourself, I guess, to other people. Huh? Exactly. Or not questioning, how come that person got this and that, and they didn't give me this, you know. Mm -hmm. You know what? It's just not your time. It's not your time. It's and, and I run into that all the time. I'm human. And that's the nice thing I feel about myself is I realize, you know, I've had a lot of nicknames. One of them's Moon Goddess. Another one's Buo, which means Owl and all this stuff. And sometimes I tend to get into my ego and think I'm like pretty pretty high up there, you know. Mm -hmm. and And then then I, I have a struggle with my humanness and I, I went through this resentment a week ago and it was really bad and I just was really pissed off and everything, you know. And that I need that. I need that to bring me back down, to make me realize that I'm human. That's part of being human. It's what you do with it. Mm -hmm. It's what you do with it. Like, get, you know, get rid of it somehow or another. Replace it with something else. Replace it with gratitude for that other person that's got something that you don't have. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of the, across the board, whether it's spiritual leaders, psychologists, counselors, they often say that's the, kind of the first stepping stone mm -hmm. of health is gratitude. Yeah. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, for sure. Like, it gets so easy to complain in, in Thunder Bay. Of, you can have all the issues in the world. And yeah. It's not saying, oh, look, you could have, be as bad as them, but if you start counting the things that yeah. are good, they start oh, accentuating. Yeah. It's, it's in the last word I think we'll touch on to wrap this up is because it really stuck with me this counselor talked about and I talked about it on, a lot, on the last podcast with the doctor but it really stuck out for me he says take that kid that you really don't like in, mm -hmm. in school you know there's all one there's always one yeah. right and he says write down 20 negative words about that kid and he taught teachers this you know and teachers, oh my God, he's annoying. You know, he's abrasive. He's I don't like the way he looks. You know, he's this. He never ties his shoes. He's this. They had a million things to carry down. He said, now write down the good. And the people said, well, I can't. He was dig, dig. Think of, oh, he's quirky, you know, or he's got a good sense of humor. But they taught them to focus on the positives and mm -hmm. not all the negatives. Because the more negatives you yeah. keep focusing on, it's easy. It's, yeah. it's, it's like what we're talking about training your, yourself and your mind. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to go down that rabbit hole of every day waking up and going, I, I catch myself. I, you probably noticed me doing it today. I'm like, oh, it's one of those universal days. Look at, okay, mm -hmm. so I'm supposed to do this at night and it's starting to rain. 
saying, oh, this yeah. is happening and this yeah. is happening. It's, oh, it's one of those days where everything goes wrong. Well, no, it's not. It's just a regular day. It's yeah. what I'm choosing to look at, right? Exactly. And I think that's where you were imparting before. Well, that was we started another. this is, is encouragement and yeah. encouragement goes along those lines because it's taking mm -hmm. it's looking for the good in someone and, and 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 watering it and encouraging yourself I think sometimes we, we you know with my Catholic Christian upbringing I was so focused on helping other people like it, it sounds selfish but help yourself if you can't if you can't do it to yourself you're not going to be able to do it to other people Mm. So, like you know, I'll, I'll, and and I, I, whenever I do it, like I say, it's my Catholic upbringing. I go, oh, you should be thinking of the other person. No, think of yourself. And if you're in a, if you're in a good mood and you're you're doing what's good for you, it's going to vibrate off to the other person. Mm -hmm. it, it it's not necessarily making other people feel good. It's feeling good yourself. Mm -hmm. And and then that rubs off on other people. Eh? It's um, yeah. Anyhow, <laughs> <laughs> wow, well, we touched on a lot. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think we're, we're right running on the two yeah. hour mark, and that's where I like to usually yeah. cap it off. But but you know, for people for people who don't know, you know, mm -hmm. in case you make this public, okay. no. Uh, <laughs> Is Mark is my fifth child. Uh -huh. I had six children. I had two adopted and four births. I think we kind of touched on that, eh? Okay. And uh, and then I've I've lost two grandchildren, and I now have seven grandchildren. And uh, one of the most beautiful gifts my daughter left behind for me um, was when she died. She had an eight-year-old daughter. And uh, that eight-year-old daughter is now 22. And she's still, it's like having my daughter around when she's around me. I just, I, I'm so grateful that I have that, you know. A lot of people, that's what I was going to say, and I got sidetracked, imagine. But um, is that you, you can't rate and you can't judge this is worse than this and this is this happened mm -hmm. to this person and I learned that because I have been judgmental in my life I have I have been and, and I try to work on that is um, I lost my daughter and I thought you know I said nothing and it is horrible to lose a child but uh, and especially your oldest so um, wouldn't be too bad if it was number five. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> no, I'm just saying it. Losing any child yes, is yes. there's an attachment there, I guess, or a love. So, this girlfriend of mine lost her dog of 15 years or so, and she had to put the dog down. And she was beside herself, and they had a funeral service and the whole bit. And in my judgmental mind, I went, "Oh my." God, like, this is ridiculous. And then I caught myself and I went, there it is, that judgment again. That dog saw her through so much tragedy in her life. That dog was always with her. Like, that dog meant tons to her. Who am I to judge that my my uh, suffering was harder than hers, you know? Meaning attached to stuff. It's like, say, even with a possession, you know what I mean? Yeah. You could lose a brand new ring you bought that was $20,000, yeah. and it's pretty big piss off, but yeah. you lose a family heirloom that was passed down, you know what I mean, that you revered, that say it was your grandmother's or something, you know? Yeah. The meaning that's attached to it. It's the meaning, yeah, yeah. So anyway, yeah. Anyway, thanks, Mark, for asking yeah. me to do this. Oh, yeah, love I love you too. All and right. End with that. Okay. <laughs> I want to see more. I know. No, I'm, just joking. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. We're gonna start dragging on. <laughs>